Good evening and welcome as people all over the country are joining together once again to solve some of Britain's most difficult and serious crimes. It all depends on you. And together we've, we've helped to unravel many of the country's most notorious cases over the years. And there have been seven more arrests since last month. We start with an extraordinary case, a double murder, or rather two separate murders, both of vulnerable people, both without apparent motive. And, as you'll see, they're linked by bizarre coincidence. They happened in January, by the seaside, in Hastings, in Sussex. Thinking about Claire since her death, my family have to face reality, whereas before, that side of life was a fiction. I think that the criminal and the victim are somehow drawn together. My daughter was looking for a companion and the criminal had his own ideas and they were brought together by some mysterious alchemy. And the criminal always chooses the weakest in society, just as a lioness will choose the wounded deer. Claire was not suited for the cut and thrust of ordinary life. She was too much of an innocent, you know. I had this plan in my head to try and rehabilitate her, if you like. I blame myself deeply for letting her drift on in her own sweet way. I used to arrive every Sunday because otherwise she did not have visitors. So I th felt I ought to make myself a visitor and a friend. Basically, I was taking her out because she'd mentioned that she was depressed. I think she felt the loneliness of it. In the basement, she was isolated from the rest of the community. And uh, I think that depressed her. Now then, where would you like to go? Each Sunday, they went shopping. And then Claire's father would take her for high tea. That day, they went to Littlewoods, where there's a cafe in the store. They got back to Claire's flat in Cornwallis Gardens around 5 p.m. Well, I'll see you next Sunday, weather permitting. Thanks for the tea. Bye. Bye. We both changed together. She was changing me and I was changing her. I felt really there was a warmth coming through and then it was stopped, which I very much regret. I was stopped in midair. About an hour and a half later, a jogger ran down Cornwallis Gardens. Was this you? Six feet tall, mid-twenties, with sandy blonde hair. Then, half an hour later, opposite Claire's flat. Well, I was going to pick up my boyfriend, and there's not normally many um, places to park the car, but luckily there was about three car spaces, so I just pulled in. And as I did, I saw a car um, in front of me, facing me, with its engine running and the lights on. It was similar to a red Escort can't be sure and the headlights were square it makes me think that either somebody was sitting in the car waiting for somebody to come out of the flat or that they were maybe in a hurry and they were just nipping in to get something and come back out and that's why they left the car running with the lights on whose was this red saloon neighbors reported the fire at 7:15. Claire Letchford was found dead from smoke poisoning.
Then, a week later, detectives met the next victim. It's so terrible for someone to die in a house fire like that. Awful. Terrible. Could I just take your name and address in case we have to contact you later? Yes, of course. Thanks very much. It's Mrs. Beryl O'Connor, Dorney O'Connor, and it's 53 Clifton Court, Holmesdale Gardens. It's just over there. Fine. Thanks very much. Thanks for all your help. You're very welcome. Thank you. Here, let me give you a hand. Oh, thanks very much. Just about to go and buy some ciggies. It was certainly ironic, but it was also very, very tragic. And we're talking about uh, another victim. Um, and then the following day, she herself becomes a victim. I've worked on several murder inquiries in my career. Certainly that has never happened to me before, and, and I hope that it never happens again. Known her for about six years. She was young at heart. She had so much to talk about, like, you know, interesting things she'd done in her life. Everyone just really took a shine to her because she was, I'd say, lovely. Remarkable, really. Hello, David. Hello, Johnny. Now, let me take that for you. Thank you, dear. Sit yourself down. Thank you. How are you, anyway? Not too bad. The old bones are a bit creaky. Never mind. Are you on a drink? It's whiskey, please. isn't it? Yes, please. Oh, whiskey, please, Barman. 20 to 9 next morning, Monday, January the 26th, just up the hill from Claire's flat, Dawney's home in Clifton Court. I've known her since we've been here, but not really got to know her world till her husband died. That was last June. And that's how I came to be doing the shopping for her, because I'd be going up the shop and if she, I said, well, give me a ring if you want anything, which she used to do. Here's your bread. Rose? What's that wet down there? Look, there's some more over there. It could be paw prints. No. If it had been water, I thought, well, it may be dried up or disappeared. So I was a bit worried. Come on. Let's go and check the rest of the flat. You just don't know who comes in and out. If it had been on my door, I don't know what I would have done. Um, that's why I was worried, because she's on her own up there. She couldn't you know, move quick. You are good, Rose. Her neighbour was so concerned that she checked on Dorney several times that Monday morning. She last spoke to her just before lunchtime. Thank you, Rose. Later, forensic analysis would find that the liquid at the entrance to the flat was mineral oil, possibly a lubricating oil. At 2.35, in a neighbouring block, a man was seen near the stairwell to Dorney's flat. He was slim and in his twenties with dark hair. Who was he? Five minutes later, and just down the road, detectives were continuing their inquiries into Claire Letchford's death. Um, I didn't see her that much, uh, say, um, uh, on average about two or three times a month. Um, sometimes when she went past the window, I asked her to come in. She was like a lost sheep. Lonely sort. Not very good at looking after herself. Excuse me. Hello. Oh, hello, Dorney. No, I can't talk right now. She um, seemed agitated. And I got the impression she wanted to get, get out of the flat, you know. OK, I'll see you in a minute. The day was so muddled up, what with the police coming to tell me about Claire and, and then dawn ringing. It completely went out of my head. When the police come for the second time and told me that Dawny was dead, and I nearly passed out. There were two lovely, lovely, lonely people, and now they won't be there anymore. It was approaching the bridge that I saw this man on the right side of it. Looked like someone in his early 20s. He was five foot nine, ten, medium built. He had uh, very dark hair, brushed to one side, slightly longer over the years. 
you could see that his chin was slightly square and his eyebrows very uh, prominent. Who was this? An innocent jogger or a double killer? At around the same time, a few yards up the road, firemen were called to Clifton Court. Dawny O'Connor was found in her burning flat. She'd been strangled. Chemi Penis must have had a profound effect on the community. These murders have caused immense distress to the community and devastation to the family of Claire and Dawn. Dawn was a, a, a smashing person. She was lively, young at heart, and Claire was gentle, and she wouldn't have harmed anybody. Now, with no obvious motive, is the killer likely to be somebody who appears to be weird, who, who acts strange, or at least did around this time in January? You're absolutely right. We have no logical or obvious motive, and it's quite likely that the offender would have behaved strangely before or after these crimes. Now, obviously, there are people in the film that you want to eliminate, that you want to trace. Is there anybody else you need to find? Yes, uh, the week before Claire's murder, there were some young children messing around in a basement flat next door. They're um, two boys and a girl, aged between 10 and 14. They're not in any trouble, but we need to know who they were. So, if you know who those kids were around Cornwallis Gardens on Sunday, the 11th of January, call us straight away. What about the two victims? I mean, have you traced all of their friends? I mean, these aren't people who would have let anybody in the door. They wouldn't have let strangers in. No, they were very security conscious, and it's very unlikely they would have let strangers in. We've spoken to many people, um, friends and people who knew these um, two ladies, but if you haven't come forward yet, please do so. And do you know, now know all you need to know about their movements around the time they were killed? Well, in, in respect of Claire, um, her father had uh, an arrangement with her whereby he would meet her in her flat at about three o'clock. Now, Claire wasn't there um, on that Sunday, and we don't know where she was earlier on the day. So if you know where, where she was, please give us a ring. Sunday the 18th of January. That's right. What about Dorney? Accounted for all her time? Now, uh, Dorney, the critical time is 20 to 3 to 20 past 3 on that Monday. We know that uh, Dawny was alive at 20 to 3 because she rang a friend and at uh, 20 past uh, the fire alarm went off so the killer would have left her flat between those times. And it was around 20 past 3 that that runner was seen on the bridge which is really right outside her flat. We had the artist's impression. That's right, we put a lot of effort into tracing that man and he hasn't come forward. It may, it's purely for elimination purposes. Okay. Just tell me what the significance you think of the oil was at Dawny's flat on the, on the floor and how can viewers help about that? I don't know what the significance of the oil is. However, that might be the last piece of the jigsaw puzzle in somebody's mind. If you're suspicious about somebody and you suddenly realise that back in January they had a can of oil they were carrying around with them, then we need to know. OK. This is a very, very rare offence, of course. There's a reward of £10,000, but above all, these murders have caused a lot of grief, as you've just heard, and they still represent a serious danger. Here's Claire's father once again. I would appeal to the family of the killer and ask them to consider very deeply whether what they are doing is the right thing. Think about it very deeply. 0500 500 600 600. And obviously the importance of calling now is to prevent another death. That's our free call to us here, live in the studio. And other detectives on the case are standing by on 01 424 456 060. That's Hastings 456 060. Seven weeks ago, two men entered a building society in Upper Tooting, South London, produced a handgun and demanded cash. Instantly, a siren went off and the men fled empty-handed. Do you know this man sprinting away? He's about 30 and fairly short, maybe five foot four. Or this man in the blue check shirt. He's tall, about six foot and around 25. And is this the same man pictured in a shop nearby? If you can identify these people, do call us now on 0500 600 600 or call the Barnes Flying Squad on 0181 247 7931. That's 0181 247 7931. Now, this is a cash container, and be warned, it's armed and it's dangerous. Many are fitted with anti-theft devices. This one from Securicor will spew out red smoke, which will penetrate your skin, your hair, your clothes, and your car, and it won't come out. The dye also ruins any banknotes inside but one robber had luck on his side. The cash canister he took wasn't primed. It happened three weeks ago at nine in the morning outside Lloyd's Bank in York Road, opposite London's Waterloo Station. A man with a gun walked up to a Securicorps guard and told him, give me the money or I'll shoot you. 
Is this the gunman? If not, he could be an important witness. Who is he anyway? He's in his late 30s, 5 foot 9 and stocky with short dark hair. 0500 600 600 or call the Barnes Flying Squad on 0181 247 7931. That's 0181 247 7931. One Saturday last month, a young woman travelled to London for the day to visit friends. She barely knew the city, but like most people, she assumed the capital was relatively safe, which it is. But what happened to her was almost unprecedented. She explains a sequence of events, starting as she began her journey home from Balham in South London. Sorry? This was about half seven at night, Saturday night. I don't use the underground very often either. I don't, I don't know my way from station to station, though. Who was this just behind her at Balham Station, 7.30 p.m. on Saturday the 14th of March? Mid-twenties, perhaps five foot nine, with shaved hair under a baseball cap. He was right behind her down the escalator, and when they reached the platform, he started talking to her. General chit-chat. I remember seeing him again on the train. And we stood holding on to the, um, the pole by the doors, and then he came up behind me. And um, I saw he had a gun on him. He said, um, don't do anything stupid. Um, if, you, if you don't do as you're told, I'll kill you. Maybe you saw them on the Northern Line to Stockwell, where they changed to the Victoria Line and on to Highbury and Islington. He did seem sort of like, like Jekyll and Hyde. It was one minute he... He could be quite nice. The next minute, he, was, he, he had sort of a very nasty streak in him. Um, I was frightened. He held her so tightly, she had bruises on her arm. Notice him now without the baseball cap. Did you see them at Highbury and Islington, Saturday, 8 o'clock, about four weeks ago? She can't recall how far they walked, but he took her to a terraced house, three or four storeys, with steps down to a basement. But she was taken up steps to the main entrance, a white front door with glass in it, and someone else inside. I remember asking to go to, to the bathroom, um, because I thought I could get out somehow. But the bathroom, it turns out, was downstairs in the basement. And uh, once I got in there, I could, there was no windows or anything. So I was trapped in there. Over the next two hours, she was assaulted, drugged, then raped. Finding herself alone for a moment, she took a chance, made for a basement door and got outside, but her abductor ran down the road after her. I remember running up a street. It was uphill. He was coming after me. He just had some trousers on, I think. He didn't have any shoes or anything on, so there were two people walking along there. And I was crying and he was coming after me and shouting. Around 10.20, somewhere near Dalston, Saturday the 14th of March. You'd remember the scene, a man with no shirt or shoes. Or maybe you've suspicions about who this man might be. London accent with access to a flat somewhere around Dalston. The victim was rescued by the driver of this red hatchback who took her to Dalston Kingsland Station. If that Good Samaritan was you, please call now. The victim then sought refuge in a takeaway on Dalston High Road. She was almost hysterical, but three men came to help her. Please call if you know who they were. Well, f at first I was trying to be calm and everything. Then, uh, as I think as reality dawned as what, what had happened, I was crying and getting more hysterical, um, and I just wanted to, I wanted to go home. I just wanted to be back in, in familiar surroundings. I just hope um, he can sleep at night, because I can't. <laughs> Please help to identify the rapist. Was the flat in Dalston his? Did he share it, or was he perhaps buying drugs there? Now, he was wearing a baseball cap, similar to this one, and a jacket looking very much like this. Perhaps you recognise them? Now, the second man who answered the door to the flat was black. He was slim, five foot nine or ten, and he was in his thirties. Did you see the girl that night, or perhaps even you spoke to her? Now, that red car that rescued her might have been a Vauxhall Cavalier, a B, C or a D registration. Now, perhaps it was a minicab. Please, if you think you helped the victim and that this was you talking to her... Where's the tube station? What's the name? 
now if you, th if you think that you were that driver and was this you on foot who spoke to her opposite Dalston Kingsland station as she continued that mobile phone call now this is an extremely serious and an upsetting offence if you can stop it happening again please ring us now on 0500 600 600 or call the British Transport Police on 0171 387 0354 that's 0171 387 0354 Seven arrests since last month's programme, four as a direct result of viewers' calls, three at least as an indirect result. And on top of that, two of our three reconstructions look very much as though they're on the way to being solved. And what's more, a direct result from a reconstruction two months ago, in which a woman was terrorised and tied up while a gang ransacked her home. Because of information from Crime Watch viewers, two men have now been arrested. And incidentally, on that case, a man rang a police station on four separate occasions. He could have vital information, and police would like him to call again. The number, 01536 411 411. That's 01536 411 411. In last month's programme, we showed how three children had been waylaid on a railway station at Lewis in Sussex and taken by train to Glynde, where they were very seriously assaulted. Well, several viewers called to name a man, and at the same time, police received other information. A man has now been charged. Now to two men to keep away from. Their trick is to go into a shop where they say they can't speak English. They offer to pay for something with a £50 note and try to explain how they want the change. In the confusion, the big man gets his hand in the till. This is an antique shop in Marlborough in Wiltshire. A similar trick was tried at this shop in Farnborough, Hampshire. And you may be able to tell us about other cases which may be linked. If you recognise either of these men, do call us 0500 600 600. The man on the left is about 5 foot 10, 50-ish and bald. The one on the right is shorter with glasses and a bit more hair. Please call the local police on 01672 512 311. That's Marlborough, 512 311. Next, an exceptionally well-dressed fraudster. He's well-dressed because he spends his time and other people's money on lavish shopping trips for designer clothes. A wallet was stolen from an office in Whitechapel, East London, and later on this man appeared in London's West End, here in a designer clothes store in Covent Garden. He's in his late 20s, early 30s, with short hair, glasses, and he also has a small moustache. Call us right now if you know him, 0500 600 600, or call direct on 0181 217 4197. That's 0181 217 4197. We've had about 50 calls so far, the Hastings double murder, 28 so far logged here in the studio. Five names have been put up uh, for the potential murder, uh, two, incidentally, names have been put up for the jogger on the bridge, remember the railway bridge just by the flats. Somebody's rung and said that he was the jogger, but he hasn't left a name, which isn't very helpful. If that was you, call again, please. Jill. In early January, there was a robbery on a jeweller's in Warwickshire, an attack involving two stolen cars and in which a firearm was used. At least ten people witnessed the events, but despite a wealth of detail, the robbers have escaped until now. Maybe you can change their luck. We've been in Warwick for 21 years in retail, and I enjoyed the shop. The thought that goes through my mind is, what sort of a day are we going to have today? I went to answer the door because I did have a phone call on the Wednesday and I thought it was this customer. All right, all right. I'm coming. I'm coming. Don't murmur all of this goes off. When I first saw the gun, I was totally shocked. 
I'll kill you. Shut up, or you're dead. You're hurting my chest. I can't breathe. When I heard the doorbell, I hoped it was a customer or someone. It won't be long, Bab. Just keep calm or I'll shoot you. How you doing? Not long. When I realised it was an accomplice, my heart did sink. I was petrified. I didn't really have very many thoughts. I was just frightened to death. I was here on holiday with my fellow students. We'd come to see the castle, and it didn't open till 10. So I said, well, I'm going to walk around. Get that ring off her finger! It's the ring that my husband gave me, which I have had for 45 years. I noticed straight away that there was a guy working in the window, and he was clearing out the jewelry. And I thought, well, he's, you know, he works there. Then I noticed he had on these black gloves. And I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. Then it all just hit me that this guy, he was stealing. Then I noticed that there was a sort of getaway car behind me. And the, the, the driver saw me, he started beeping the horn. I mean, a quiet, nice little town like Warwick, one doesn't expect this to happen, especially on the main street. I feel both fear and anger. I am very nervous. For the moment, this has changed me, but I'm not going to let them ruin my life. I'm not going to let them get me down. The robbers drove about two miles out of town along the B4095 towards the Warwick Bypass. But instead of turning onto the bypass, they took a track beside it that leads past the Warwick Rugby Club. There, they abandoned the blue escort and headed for a little chef restaurant, to the surprise of some of the customers. I didn't know you could park a car down there. How do you get it in? You can't for it. It's a sports sale. Well, there's a car just parked and three fellows have got out. They're coming in here. Oh, no, they're not. They're going straight past. The first man was about six feet tall, 30 years old, stocky build with dark hair, a roundish face, pale complexion, red lips, a pointed nose and dark eyes. The driver was shorter than the others, about five foot eight, slim build, 30 years old, dark hair and what's described as a Barry McGuigan type moustache. That's strange. Oh, look, they've, they've gone to a, a white box all over there now. In fact, they've, they've gone into that. It looks just like a vehicle switch. Someone's driven up, dumped one car, transferred to another. The most suspicious thing of all was the speed they drove off in the Vauxhall Astra at. They actually screamed away as if they were escaping. And it was that really that compounded the suspicion. The Astra headed north up the Warwick Bypass and was later dumped at the co-op supermarket at Sturchley in South Birmingham. George Stephanie, a hundred thousand pounds worth of jewellery taken. Is there anything in particular you're looking for people, you're asking people to look for? Well, there's three items that are unusual and indeed expensive. Now, I'm sure that those are still in circulation. Now, we're looking at these rings here. They're very distinctive and they do look very expensive, yes. certainly. Anything else you're looking for? Uh, the small boxes that uh, some of the other jewels were held in. They've got the jeweller's name, H.H. Bray, inside, and also the cards. Now, they support the value of the gems and also a description of them. 
I'm sure they will attract attention. Mm. Now, what about the cars that the robbers used? Two stolen cars, weren't yes. they? What about them, the, uh, the Ford Escort, first of all? Well, the Escort was abandoned at the service station, as you saw in the clip. Um, the Astra, that was found uh, later on uh, on the uh, car park of the co-op in Sturchley, Birmingham. So sometime on the 9th, we're looking for a sighting of that being left there. And we must also say that the, um, that the Escort has actually been returned to its uh, proper yes. owner, so we don't want to know where it is now. Now, what about the nature of the robbers themselves? Were they local, do you think? I mean, they used a phrase or a word, Babs, didn't they, which strikes me as local dialect, perhaps. Um, Babs is a, a sort of Midland term for love or dear, uh, and the robbers had Birmingham accents, so we have to think there's a strong Birmingham connection. Mm, and this wasn't a spontaneous action. They'd obviously planned this crime to the nth degree, hadn't they? It's clear it's very well planned. They knew the lady would be alone that morning. They knew of an unusual route to the service station there on the Warwick Bypass, and clearly they had a second car, a getaway car, ready and waiting for them. Now, if somebody knows where that car it's, it's a problem. Mm. And do you think they might have sort of tipped a few people off in the underworld? You know, they might have discussed it among their uh, criminal fraternity? I'm sure there's been a lot of conversation about this. Somebody knows somebody responsible for this. Is there a financial incentive for anybody to ring in if they have any knowledge about this? The lady, she was seriously hurt and she's traumatised. But we're talking of a £5,000 reward now for information leading to the arrest and conviction of these people and also a 20% reward if we recover property from this matter. Well, George Stepney, thank you very much. Thank and let's not forget, this was a serious crime. A firearm was involved, and that lady was traumatised very seriously. 0500 600 600, if you can help, there may be a reward, as we've said. Now, that number is direct here to the Crime Watch studio, but other detectives on the case are standing by on 01926 415 747. That's Warwick, 415 747. Are you, like me, annoyed that white-collar crime, especially major fraud, often goes unpunished? Well, you can help adjust the balance. Do you know this man? His name is Mark Henderson. 30 years old, 5 foot 10, slim, with short brown hair and usually smart appearance. Someone very much like him swindles suppliers out of hundreds of thousands of pounds. If you know him or have seen him, give us a call right away on 0500 600 600 or call the Kent Fraud Squad on 01622 654 803. That's Maidstone 654 803. Now, two women, one of whom is trying to cash a stolen cheque. Here she is in a bank in Perivale, West London. The cheque is from a handbag that had just been stolen from an elderly shopper at a supermarket in nearby Wembley. We assume this other woman is entirely innocent, but she may be able to help tell us who the fraudster is. The two seem to know each other. If you recognise either of them, do give us a call on 0500 600 600 or call direct on 0181 733 3223. That's 0181 733 3223. A few months back, we reported how, with help from Crime Watch viewers, a callous thief had been caught and sent to prison. He'd been posing as a police officer and targeting elderly people to steal their savings. Well, now we need to catch another man doing the same thing, again, preying on the vulnerable. This time, there's a pretty big police operation because he's caused misery for a large number of people in Newport, in South Wales. He's tried it on at least 25 times over the last three years, and all his victims have been aged over 70. The start of his pattern of offences was in March 1995 in the Cullian Road area of Newport. Then onto either side of the River Usk, first aiming at bungalows and then onto nearby terraced houses. How does he travel? Does he have a car? He appears well dressed and his manner is polite. Is he a local man with no commitments? Is he self-employed or unemployed? He's often free during the week and at different times of the day. In the reconstruction which follows, details from several cases have been amalgamated to reveal as much about him as we can and to hide the identity of his victims. I keep up with my bills and never owe anything. So I used to keep the £20 notes that I had with my pension on one side and pay the big bills like the council rates and, and all that out of it. Yes? Mrs Roberts? Yes? What do you want? It's the police. Have you any ID? Can I come in? You better sit down. I can't stay long. I tell you what it is, Mrs Roberts, there's been a lot of forged notes 
going around this area recently? Have you any 20 pound notes? Yes. Could I see one, please? Yes. I keep my notes here. Thank you. Oh, dear, I thought so. That can't be a fake. Do you have any more? Yes. Can I see them? Here you are. I tell you what, you couldn't get me a damp cloth, could you? So I can test them? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Roberts. Well, I suppose so. When I came back from the kitchen, he was gone, and I couldn't see sign of him anywhere. He left the doors open and just went. Hello? I started shaking all over, panicked, you know, and I thought, I wonder if he'll come back. I knew he wouldn't. Couldn't wait for the police to get there. It's after that it's all over that you begin to think, I wish I'd done this, I wish I'd done that. But you don't think of it, do you? Especially when he said he was from the police. Well, one of the first attacks that he carried out was on a, on a very elderly lady. She was 92 years of age. Um, and uh, we are absolutely positive that he followed her from a post office. Um, and she has never, ever returned to the house at all. The thief is probably in his 40s and well built. His face is said to be round. One woman talks of his complexion being very pale. His hair is jet black, though it might be dyed. Some witnesses thought it was a wig. Apart from his generally smart appearance, there's nothing consistent about his clothing. He seems to have several homemade versions of an ID card. Do you recognize this man? Or have you been approached by him and not reported it? Maybe the amount he stole was trivial. Maybe you were just too upset to tell anyone. And there have been several times when he's tried to rob people and didn't get away with it. In fact, now we'll show how important it is to check, at least with someone, if you're worried or in doubt. <coughs> My mother, she's an unbeliever. She don't really believe what people say. Especially when it comes to money as well. I'm from the police. Oh, you'd better come in. Come through here. You haven't got to mention the police and old people are nervous. I believe you've been paying some bills with forged notes, love. I don't think so. Listen, can I have a look at your money? What for? Well, you might have some forged bills, see, without knowing it. Oh, I'm sure I haven't. Well, let me have a look anyway. I think I'm going to phone my daughter. Now, there's no need for that. I'll just go and check with my colleague in the car. I am going to phone my daughter. That day, I think I would have ran him over if I saw him coming out of the house, because I was that angry. Because it was my mother, and that like, people won't want to live on their own because of the fear of people coming into the house. He's been committing these offences for nearly three years, and he's caused such a lot of distress that the police have at times had over 30 officers on the case. Now, please, think carefully. The man knows Newport very well, and he has a local accent. Who do you know, do you know who's well-built, with a pale complexion, jet black hair, perhaps a jet black wig? The first offence was in March 1995. The second was in August 1996. Now, that's a gap of 18 months. Where was he during that time? If you know, well, you can do the community a lot of good. 0500 600 600 or call the local police on 01 633 245 treble 3. That's Newport 245 treble 3. Earlier this year, there was a high-speed car chase in Liverpool. Two men were caught, but the third escaped. It followed a surveillance operation involving a gang of burglars who targeted large country houses. This man is now being sought. He's Richard Norman Blundell, 36, 5'10", athletic build with short dark hair and a swarthy complexion. 
Detectives have issued a stern warning. He may be armed and should not be approached by members of the public. But if you've noticed him anywhere, do give us a call 0500 600 600 or call the National Crime Squad in Merseyside on 0151 777 6580. That's 0151 777 6580. Last August in Leicester, someone produced an automatic pistol and a family man, Costin Tucker, was shot three times. He died in hospital a few hours later. Detectives have been trying to trace this man, Hamza Latif. You may know him as Osron Samuel, the name he had until he converted to Islam in his teens. He regularly goes to the mosque. He's 29, 5 foot 11, and he might have grown that beard and moustache, or indeed shaved them off. If you've seen him anywhere do, or know him, do give us a call right away. Or you can call Leicestershire Police on 0116 248 6806. That's Leicester 248 6806. Well, I'm pleased to say that after a relatively slow start, you're now keeping our officers and researchers in the studio here very busy with your calls. They're coming in all the time now. Mm, getting on for 60 calls on the murder of two women in, in Hastings. We've got, uh, uh, well, we've got nine names for a suspect here. On the Tooting attempted armed robbery, two calls. We've had one name. Several calls on the abduction and the rape of the woman who uh, started her journey at Ballam Tube Station. We've had about 19 calls on that one. Eight names put forward so far. Uh, the Marlborough Antiques Deception, 22 calls and three names, several calls again on the designer clothes card fraud and uh, quite a few interesting calls on the Warwick armed robbery as well. Now, an appeal to Sudanese doctors. Someone has been operating a widespread con. Somehow, he finds out the names of doctors and their pager numbers, and then he prays on the Sudanese custom that you should always help someone in distress. He somehow spins a yarn that his wife and child, who are Sudanese, badly need money which the doctors give. He seems charming, but then, of course, that's the essence of being a con man. Now, take a look at this man. He was stopped in a car by traffic police, and he bears a close resemblance to the con man. He gave a false name and address, but if you can identify him, do please call us now, or you can call the local police on 01522-885-236. That's Lincoln, 885-236. Our lines are open here in the studio for well over an hour yet. We'll be taking calls till midnight. You'll see other numbers in a moment. They're also listed on CFAX on page 621. If you're on the internet, you can reach us at Crime Watch UK at the BBC. That's CWUK at bbc.co.uk. And if you have any information on any crime at all, try Crime Stoppers. And you can call them anonymously if you want on 0800 555 one. We'll have more news in Crime Watch update at 20 to 12. And if you can't stay up that late, well, remember the date for Crime Watch next month, Tuesday, May the 19th. And you can now log on to Crime Watch at any time. We've launched a new website, and it has all tonight's faces, all tonight's clues. And you'll find it at this address, www.bbc.co.uk slash Crime Watch. That's BBC Co. UK Crime Watch. Calls to Crime Watch work. Eight million people out there are trying to help right now. So don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Actually...